Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, my dear friends and fellow travelers. Welcome to Albion Bible Church Online. Uh, and it's so good to be with all of you once again. I pray that your week has gone well. I pray that uh, the Lord's blessings be very much evident in your lives. And and uh, don't forget, if you, uh, if you need prayer, contact us. We have our email listed below. And uh, just, just send us your requests. Uh, and uh, if, if the Lord has done something wonderful in your life and you'd like to share it, you'd like to proclaim it, you know, send that to us too. We'll celebrate along with you. So whether you need prayer for, for something that you're going through, uh, through grief or a loss or anything of any kind or, or a need, anything of any kind, send that to us. Uh, it doesn't matter how small or how big it is. And, uh, and if likewise, if it's something that you want to celebrate, uh, send that to us too, and uh, we will uh, we'll add you to our prayer list, and we will we will pray with you as well. Okay, all right, excellent. So let's uh, take a look at our uh, message for today, and I'd like to go to the uh, the the great book of Hebrews. So we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. So it's just two verses. Um, uh, but, um, or three verses, excuse me. But uh, but there's a lot packed in here. And I think it's it's appropriate for uh, you know, us just coming out of the Easter season and the, the context that, uh, that, uh, that the, uh, the writer of, of Hebrews is trying to convey here. So join me in Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. And uh, if you want to read along with me, as always, I invite you to, uh, because it's so important for us to read Scripture, and, and I mean read it, not just with your with your mind, but to actually engage your 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 mouth, your breath, everything, just just to to actually read Scripture. So if you'd like to do that, and you'd like to read along with me, pause the video, find it in either your text Bible or in your Bible app or your on your phone or your tablet. And uh, once you find it, press play, or and uh, and we can read together. Okay, so Hebrews chapter four, starting at verse fourteen down to verse sixteen. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may have, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. May Almighty God bless us the reading of His holy word. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit, Lord, we give you thanks and praise, O Lord, for, for the, uh, the gift of your word and for the many ways you have provided for us, dear Lord, uh, just by through, through the, the grace of your divine providence, Lord, in, in assisting us and helping us and guiding us through in every aspect of our lives. And, uh, and Lord, your word is that supreme guide. It's that supreme. It's, it's, it's your very word, dear Lord, given to, to human agents to, to pass on to us so that we may know your heart and mind and may be transformed down to our very core of who we are into the people that you want us to be so that we may be able to go boldly out into the world and proclaim your, the good news of your gospel to those who do not know you yet. So, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this. Thank you for this word, dear Lord. What a great gift that you have given to us, O oh Lord, so that we may know who you are and we may know your heart and we may get to know you personally, Lord. In your name we pray, Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> the members of Parliament in the United Kingdom, they hold what are called surgeries. Uh, with their constituents. Now, uh, surgery over there, now, undoubtedly, anyone who lives in America, uh, well, when you think of surgery, you think of going to the doctor and going to the hospital and having something fixed or removed or something defective. But, uh, but 
when Parliament holds surgery, <laughs> that sounds like that, maybe that sounds like a terrifying idea. A politician doing a surgery, uh, but no uh, surgeries in uh, in the Parliament in the Parliament. Terry, uh, in the parliamentary uh, state, um, it's an opportunity for people who voted for the particular uh, uh, members of the, the, the parliament to, to talk to them. So this is a chance for dialogue between the people and the politicians. Okay, it has nothing to do with surgical or doctoral, you know, any kind of medical procedure. This is just an opportunity to talk. Okay. Uh, but the reality is that relatively few people actually have a conversation with their MP, even though there are there's avenues for people to be able to talk to their their uh, their representative in Parliament um, to have surgery with their with their uh, member of Parliament. Relatively few people take that opportunity to talk to their their representatives. Now, God's surgery, God's prayer line of conversation, God's throne of grace is ava available through Jesus Christ. The question is, is whether we actually go there. Do we go there often? Do we go there daily? Do we realize we can go there? We can boldly approach the throne of grace and meet Christ and talk with Christ, commune with him. Do we approach the Lord with expectation of receiving his blessing? So this I, I this is what this is one of my favorite passages in scripture. One one of one of many favorites, but this is one of my favorites. And uh, the the writer of this uh, of this this uh, letter this this epistle now we're not sure a, a lot of people historically attribute it to Paul uh, we're, but we're not really sure for not absolutely sure whether Paul actually wrote this this letter or not it could have been but uh, but it could have been just uh, it could have been somebody else but obviously whoever wrote the the the, the letter to the Hebrews uh, had a very very intimate knowledge of the way the old sacrificial Jewish sacrificial system worked and also had a very deep under and high view of Christ and a deep understanding of of Christ's saving work upon the cross and his resurrection uh, so um, so obviously whoever wrote it and, 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 and I don't think it really matters it's not a point of contention to, to fight over who may have written this book. What is important is the context and the content of the book. And, um, and, and right off the bat here in this, in just these few short passages, uh, we see Jesus referred to as the high priest. Okay. The, the writer of Hebrews recognizes Jesus as the high priest. Okay. And, and that, that is drawing a parallel with the old sacrificial system. And the writer is actually saying that Jesus completes that system. He's the pinnacle of that old sacrificial system where there was, there was a need for a high priest once a year who would go into the Holy of Holies, you know, behind this big, thick curtain and offer before the, 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 the mercy seat or the throne of grace that was, that was placed in there. And he would offer up uh, sacrifices for the sins of the people. And he did that once a year. Well, Jesus is recognized as our great high priest, the pinnacle of the high priest. He is the high priest. There is no need for any more because of his, because he, he did truly make a sacrifice for the people, not just for the people of Israel, but for the people of the world. And the sacrifice he offered was not. Uh, the carcass of some animal, but it was his own body that he offered as sacrifice so that for the forgiveness of our sins and and his rising from the dead on the third day proved his his power over death and his power over sin and uh, the, the, the the completion of the work of salvation was was completed and successful so, he has the virtue of being 
uh, of being the high priest. There's no need for a high priest anymore. There's no need to even approach the, the throne of grace or the mercy seat with a, a human representative because we have the ultimate human God-man representative, Jesus Christ, who did that work for us already. And so by his position, being the Son of God, the Messiah, who came to do this, to die for us upon the cross, and he'd completed that work, you know, he holds that that position of high priest by virtue of who he is and by his mission. There's no need for a high priest anymore. The, the, the work of salvation has been completed. There's no need for more sacrifice because the ultimate sacrifice has already been given. It was Jesus himself who sacrificed himself. Okay. So he holds this position of great honor and great responsibility. You know, um, <clears throat> so Jesus is the full, he is the ultimate fulfillment of the duty of the high priest. He fulfilled that. And, and as scripture tells us, if we read elsewhere in scripture, it's, it, 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 it teaches it. I think it's the apostle Paul talks about this, but he, uh, he forever intercedes for us. You know, but you know, we, we have one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ, right? And he, he is seated upon the right hand, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, always interceding for us. He is our representative. He is before God. And when God looks upon him, he see and looks upon us, and those those who have been washed by his blood, those who have who have come in repentance, and asking for his grace, who has received his grace, when God looks at us, he sees his son, the, 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 the shed blood of his son upon us. And, uh, and we, are, we, are cons we are deemed righteous, not because of anything we do, but because of what he has done. But that's his position as our great high priest. So he's the fulfillment of that duty of high priest. So we no longer need an earthly high priest. Jesus enjoys that position forever. And, and we can see that referred to in Psalm 110, verse 4. Okay? So and I, I invite you to take a look at that for yourself, if, you, if you'd like. Yeah. Now, since this fact of Jesus as high priest interceding for us always before the Father is true, and this is true, and it's true because we see the succession of events that happened after the after the crucifixion we see him rise from the dead and he appeared to there was at least 500 witnesses who saw him alive we the he we know he ascended back to the father and he's seated at the right hand of the father and with the coming of the holy spirit so we we have all of these things that that prove that he is he is this true high priest so now, as believers, we must hold fast. Think about that phrase, hold fast. Um, it's, it's, it, it literally means to cling to. Cling to. It's like, like you're, you're holding on for dear life. Okay, and that's what it's talking about. Homologia. Um, you know, so we, 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 we profess. We profess this, this, this faith. You know, with, we, we cling to it and we profess it with all our hearts, with all, with all of our being for dear life, because it, 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 it is our eternal life on the line. But if we belong to Christ, our eternal life is secure. It's secure with him and we need not worry, but we cling to him. We cling to him because anything else in the world is, is fleeting and it fails you know, it's like the old uh, hymn, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand, All Other Ground is Sinking Sand. And that is true. There is no solid footing to stand upon, especially when it comes to eternal life, when it comes to eternal destiny, when it comes to, to uh, forgiveness of sins. There's no one else we can go to but to Christ. So we cling to it. We hold fast to this confession. We hold fast to this homologia, this, 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 this confession, this faith. This profession of faith, it's, it is something we confess. It's something we admit. We confess our sins before Christ. We confess our faith to the world. Keep the faith. 
Do not allow this world with its terrors and its cares, its skeptics and accusers to take away your faith. Don't allow that. Because the world would like nothing more than to, to, to steal away whatever faith you have in Christ. Now, the faith community to which this epistle was originally addressed to were under, they were under great pressure to give up this, this new faith in Jesus and to turn back to the old ways. They were under a lot of pressure, not only from their culture, but from their families as well. Their families were like, look, because life, life at that time revolved around the synagogue. It, it, the synagogue was the center of life. If you got cut off from the synagogue, which a lot of these early believers did, because a lot, most of the early followers of Christ were Jews, they all were at, at the beginning, and then then Gentiles came in a little bit later. But but they were they belonged they they belonged to synagogues and from whatever village or town they were from, and they were threatened, and many of them were kicked out, and uh, and it was. Not only did they lose that connection, that community collect connection, but they lost their family connection as well, and they were deemed as if they were dead. They were, they were, they were basically reduced to the status of a non-person. Um, so they were being threatened by their their communities and by their families to get rid of this faith in this Jesus. Um, the, the, the status of a non-person was a, is a scary thing. Uh, a person in a culture without family ties or connections was considered dead. You know, um, here in, 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 you know, in, in, the, in, in the West, um, family connections are important. But, um, but in, in the, the, this part of the world, the Mediterranean part, the, the, the Middle Eastern part of the world, family connections were everything. They're, they're the most, they are, and they, they, to this day, they, they are the most, in, in a lot of places, they are, they are still the most important thing. Instead of being asked when you, like, you know, a lot of people, when they meet somebody for the first time, they're trying to get to know them. One of the, one of the things that inevitably comes up, usually one of the first things that comes up is, well, what do you do for a living? Or what did you do for a living if you're retired? You know, what did you do? Um, in those cultures, no, the first, the first question is, what, where's, what's your, Who's your family? Where's your family from? What's your family connections? See, those are those are much more important, and uh, you can see why to lose those family connections, those synagogue connections, was uh, was a, a devastating loss. See, that is why this new community of faith, the kingdom of God, was so important because it gave life and meaning. And belonging under the common lordship of Jesus Christ, the great high priest, to people who had lost that. And all within the kingdom are bound together by the common blood of Jesus Christ shed for the sins of all. The faith is lived in community. This truth must still stand within the contemporary church. Otherwise, the church has become something other than Christian. We, we must remember that the hold fast <laughs> cling to this as well. The, the church needs each other. We need each other. Because we have a world out there that is pressuring us to give this up, to move away from this, to deny Christ, you know, make you feel stupid or, or, uh, or unintellectual or whatever if you, if you harbor belief and trust and a, a faith in Christ. And that's why the faith community is is all the more important. Those who are people, those of like mind, who follow, who have who have committed and given themselves over to Jesus, who have come to His cross in repentance and asking forgiveness of His of sins and receiving His grace. Believers need each other. The church needs each other. It's how we. It's our support structure for one another. Because you're not going to find it in the world. As much as you might want to try to, you might try to fit in and might try to join in. No, no you, 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 the true faith in Christ is going to come at loggerheads with the the ways, the way of the philosophy, the way of thinking of the world. It just is. 
And so the writer goes on and talks about this sympathetic high priest that we have. Jesus is, is not unaware of our, of our problems. He, he's not unaware of what it means to live as a human being on this planet. You know, even though he sits in exalted state at the right hand of the Father, he does not forget the weakness of humanity. And he understands our temptations. He understands our weaknesses to sin. And, and, and you might ask, well, why is this important? And it's important to ponder upon this. You know, why is this important to, to understand this about Jesus? Why is this important? It's the, you know, see, the duty of the high priest of old was to intercede once a year, as I, as I mentioned earlier, to intercede once a year for the sins of the people by entering the Holy of Holies within the temple in Jerusalem and to make a sacrifice before the mercy seat. It was here that the ancient Hebrews believed the high priest interacted with God on behalf of the nation. However, however Jesus, being the one true high priest forever and ever, the one who died for the sins of the world upon a cruel Roman cross, has made it possible for the people to directly approach God. As the Gospel of Matthew described, the veil in the temple of Jerusalem, which separated the people from the Holy of Holies, had torn away. And now because of the grace of Jesus, any and all who are willing can approach him and receive salvation. Who better to do this than the one who understands what a struggle human life is? Because he does. He Remember, he became one of us. He was fully God and fully man at the same time, and he understood what it was what it meant to be human. Because he became one of us and lived among us makes him the best possible high priest. I mean, what what we get the best of both worlds with Jesus. We have God and the high priest within one person. The one who can effectively minister to another person is one who can relate to that person because they've experienced bad times in life. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of you understand that. Either, either you were on the receiving end of such things or, or you were the one who had suffered and realized later down the road that it was because of my suffering that now I'm able to relate to somebody else who's suffering in much the same way that I had. Okay. Jesus can relate to your struggles. He deserves your trust because he knows what suffering is like. He knows what it's like. He deserves your trust. So draw near to him. Draw near to him. Not only come closer to him, but to do so boldly with confidence and expectation. And you might say, why? Why? Well, for, number one is because he loves us. And relates to us and asks that we do so. Okay, we are to communicate with him. The Apostle Paul even goes so as far as to say to pray without ceasing. Okay, and I know all of us could pray more. We could, including myself. But we need that connection with our saving, living, saving Lord Jesus, our great High Priest, who intercedes for us day and night. He is the high priest. He intercedes for us. His wounds and shed blood are a testimony to this. And he did this and offers this to all of you. Yes, you. You right there. It's for all of you. And not only draw near to him with confidence, with confidence, not, not because it is some kind of, there, there's some kind of, self-confidence swagger going on here or no no but in confidence in who he is in confidence and understanding the kind of love he has for you the agape love the love that's committed that perfect commitment love that that he means what he says if he has said it then he means it and he's not going to go back on his word and you, you can trust in that so not only draw near to him with confidence, but to his very to his very throne of grace. We don't need a high priest to do that. He's the high priest, and we can approach him. The very throne of grace. And these supreme truths concerning his love must garner our trust in him. 
These are these are some of the most foundational beliefs in, in, in our faith. The, the ability to come boldly before the throne of grace, come boldly to Christ himself and encounter the, the living, saving Lord Jesus, our great high priest for ourselves, that we can, we can approach him. We don't need somebody else to do it for us. You and I, we all have unlimited access to our living, saving Lord. Remember, the veil in the temple was torn completely away, completely completely exposing the Holy of Holies. And that's symbolic of how we can, each of us can approach the throne of grace. We don't need somebody else. We don't need a pastor or a priest or anybody to intercede on our behalf. Christ does that. It says so in his very word. So each of us can boldly come. Any of us can come before him. He's waiting to hear from you. You know, um, Reminds me of that old, another old hymn. I, I'm, I'm often drawn to old hymns uh, when I'm speaking, but um, that old hymn, Jesus is Calling, you know. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling to you and to me. Dear sinner, come home. Come to him. Yes, Jesus is exalted and is and mighty, and his name is indeed above all names, and we must respect that. We must come to him humbly, but with confidence, because he is here among you, because he loves you so much. He deserves your trust. Yes, we must never forget that he is the Lord God Almighty, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. That his name is, he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He must always be respected as such. And, and we, we cannot treat him cheaply. We cannot treat him any less than with the, that respect that, that that deserves. And that fear, that awe that it deserves. But not, but, but not to the point where we feel we can't approach him personally. Because he wants us to, each of us, to approach him. But how do you draw near to How do we do that? How do, how do I draw near to Jesus. How do I draw near to the great high priest who intercedes for me in heaven? How do I come near? How do I dare come near the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? How do I dare do that? Well, it's through prayer. And it's humbly with a broken and contrite heart in prayer. Prayer is absolutely essential in relationship between God and humanity between God and us, to come humbly before him, to offer our prayers to him. Yeah, that's, that's why I, I, I'm, I'm always promoting prayer and promoting reading of your scripture. Read the word of God. Actually, make the blend those two things together. Reading scripture while you're praying to God. Make the scripture reading part of your prayers. You know, incorporate the Psalms, you know, especially the Psalms of praise. Prayer is absolutely essential to the relationship between God and us. And the essential nature of prayer to our relationship with God is what motivated men such as the Apostle Paul to declare pray without ceasing, as I mentioned earlier. And in so doing, we will find grace, receive mercy, 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 such a beautiful word. I love the word mercy. Because I know I need it so much. I need the mercy of Christ. I need Christ to be merciful to me. Because I know I have no other hope otherwise. <coughs> I have no other hope besides the mercy of Christ. And we find, we receive and find mercy and help in our time of need. And what he means by in time of need, it's talking about not not necessarily, you know, where, where things are going wrong in our lives and we need him to do this or that. But no, time of need, which which is referring to our sinful selves, to our, our sinfulness, that we find help, we find we find freedom, we find our shackles are broken, that sin is 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 wiped out of our lives. We find that in him. Because that is when we are most in need, is, is in our sinfulness. So as we receive his grace, receive his salvation, 
and washed clean by his blood, by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we truly do find our help in time of need. And draw so and as as we grow in our trust in him, as we as we, we learn that more and more how trustworthy he truly is, that he truly is there for us. And we, we see that so evident in, in his work of salvation, but we also see in his providence throughout our lives. If we if we honestly take stock of our lives and see how much he has he has worked in our lives. And the more we draw near to him, and the more we draw near to each other as, as fellow believers, expecting great things to be done through us by his power. Not not our power, but 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 his power, that, that the good news of this gospel may be spread to the to the ends of the earth through our through our words, through our deeds. I want to leave you with this story. Okay. It's uh, told by a, a guy named Mark Beard. And uh, it's called It's Too Late to Hide. I first noticed him as he shuffled past me while making his way through the crowd of excited children swarming around the room at the school for deaf and blind children outside Saigon, Vietnam. He moved slowly but steady. His arms and legs were twisted and drawn in such a way that made it impossible for him to maneuver quickly through all the activity. As he passed me by, I noticed a single golden brown teddy bear dangling limply from the tight clutch in one, uh, of one hand, flopping up and down with each movement he made. He was different from among those who were, who were different. You know, they all were different, but he was even more different, this, this young man. He did not fit in among those who did not fit in with others. Seeing as he had only one gift and other children embracing many, I remember a nearby bag of toys and with the intent of getting the boy more toys to enjoy. I turned from him and made my way through the crowd. Filling my hands with gifts, I turned back only to find that the boy was gone. I knew I had seen him. He was just there. So I began to search the room for him. He was nowhere to be found. Outside in the courtyard I searched. He was not there. Where had he gone? He couldn't have moved that quickly, I thought. But he had. Doing my best to communicate with people who spoke another language or those who spoke not at all, I tried to ask where the boy had gone. Nothing but confused stares were given. Finally, in desperation, I, I mimed the way in which he walked, in the way in which his arms were bent, and pointed, and pointed to a boy nearby. Some of the deaf children watching my poor attempt to communicate suddenly responded with wide-eyed enthusiasm and smiles and motioned for me to stay there and to wait. Then running from the room in different directions, they set off in search of the boy, only to return empty-handed and apparently bewildered about his whereabouts. The message was quickly relayed to other children and to the teachers, each responding as if they knew where to find him. Finally, a rapid tapping on my arm and a pointed finger directed my attention down the sidewalk to the boy I saw it being led arm in arm by one of the teachers. He shuffled as quickly as he could, apparently excited by the prospect that someone was looking for him. Why had he left and returned to his dorm room with only one gift when so many were available? I questioned in my mind. Later I thought about how his physical limitation, coupled with his other limitations, perhaps had been a deciding factor in choosing to take what he could get, what he could and go. Perhaps he had been overwhelmed by the excitement and quick movements of the other children as they ran from place to place with hands and arms filled with gifts and indulged themselves in the Christmas morning-like atmosphere. Maybe he thought that no one would miss him, or worse, that no one would care if he stayed. In contrast to the other children, he had one hand that he could control enough to grasp a single stuffed teddy bear. With that, he would have to be content. Maybe in his mind, having received anything at all is better than possessing nothing at all. Better to take what little he could hold and slip silently away. Better to assume what was for others was not for him than to lose what little he had been given. Even in the act of receiving gifts, he must have felt 
out of place. Alone in his dorm room, he had no idea that someone was looking for him and wanted to give him more. But as I filled his pocket with toy cars and gave more to others to be carried for him, I knew there was more for him. This human condition is seen more often than one might think. Lost among the masses, ready to receive and hoping to receive so much are those whose lives and who live their lives expecting to be overlooked, expecting to be left out. Their infirmity is that they feel different and inadequate. They do not fit, or at least they feel as if they do not fit. For them, it is easier to fade away, to slip out of the room, to assume that the happiness and the gifts of life are for others, not for us. How many of you think of feel that way? Or you feel like you just don't quite fit in? That happiness and inclusion are for others. But there is one who searches for us. It's too late to hide ourselves. It is needless to hide our weaknesses. He has seen us all in our frailty. He has seen us all in our sinfulness. He knows us for what we are, and it does not matter to him. We cannot escape him. We can only fail to respond to his call. If We, we can only fail to come to him in humbleness, with a, with a humble heart, and to receive the wonderful gifts that he has to offer. With him, our receiving is only about our response to him and, about what, and, and what is being offered, not about others' response to us. It's about what Christ has to offer in time of need, in the times of our depths of our sinfulness. We have one who loves us so much that he gave himself willingly, the, our great high priest, and he intercedes for us day and night before the Father. And praise be to that for him, for that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit, Lord, thank you so much, O oh Lord, for, for your grace that you have poured upon us. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you are, you truly are our great and one and only high priest. The only mediator that we need, O oh Lord, is you, Lord Jesus, you who sit at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us always. Lord, intercede for us. Lord, continue to intercede for us. Continue to forgive us and continue to help us to grow, to become more like you to continue to repent and turn away from our old sinful ways and face you and walk towards you to become more like you, O Lord Jesus. And in that, in that struggle, as, as, as we tr place more and more trust in you and less trust in ourselves, less trust in the things of the world, and we trust on you and we focus on you, we find help in our time of need. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, now, my dear friends, I direct you to the description box below for uh, for this week's featured video from one of the many wonderful, talented people here on YouTube. And we pray that it blesses you throughout the week. Remember to like, subscribe, and share the video if you found this useful. If you, uh, if you find this, this is something that you would like to share on with others, please do. As, uh, as it, it's, it's, it's the job of us, it's, it's, it's what we are called to do, right, as fellow followers of Christ, to, to spread the good news of the gospel. So if you like that, if you like what you see, please, do, please uh, give us a like and share and, and, uh, and subscribe and, uh, so we can continue spreading the good news of Jesus wherever we go. And so now, my dear friends, may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with your spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.